mountain I will never fear. You're the Lord of Lords, the King of glory. With all my life, I praise you for who you are. All right, welcome. Morning. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, morning. Yes, in a clap. I, man, I, if, if I get more applause, I'll say welcome again. Uh, good morning, good morning, good morning. It was a beautiful day yesterday. Hopefully, we'll have another one today. I think there's some storms rolling through, but nevertheless, God's glory is still shown even in the storms. So we will uh, we'll, we'll take joy in the rain as it replenishes uh, crops and helps things grow. I like the garden that we worked all day yesterday, and I didn't get sunburned. Yeah. Didn't get any sunburn, so thank goodness. The first 
on a warm day. But anyway, it's good to be here in the house of the Lord. Those of you who are joining us online, let us know you're here. Also, uh, let us know anything that uh, you're thankful for. Those of you who are here, as we move through his courts, I want uh, to encourage you to keep uh, thanksgiving on the forefront of your mind this morning. May it be a lens or a filter of sorts that uh, everything moves through this morning because we're here to give thanks to God. We're here to celebrate who our God is, kind of like the song was just singing, who you are. We come to celebrate who you are uh, this morning. But before we uh, get rolling too far into things, uh, Director Sarah has uh, some stuff she wants to share and celebrate with us this morning. Good morning again. So um, Friday we had a lock out instead of a lock in and we traveled around. So I'm still recovering from that even though I got some sleep yesterday. So um, we are here to celebrate another next generation big moment. Today we are celebrating first grade and 11th grade. I'm kind of starting to get to like a bittersweet moment because we only have one more month and that'll be our fifth and 12th graders. And so today we celebrate first, uh, first grade. Um, if you haven't seen these little pamphlets, these are wonderful. These are wonderful. And I know we're getting to the end of the school year, so start thinking about grabbing for your uh, friends or your grandkids or your kids, like whatever. These are very insightful. And then for birth through 18, and they're in the parent nook in the main hallway at the church. So um, feel free to grab them. We keep a, an eye on, well, we, let's be real, it's Taya, uh, keeps an eye on these to make sure they're filled. And so um, the inside for our first graders, if you open these up, these are really cool. They have like, uh, let me read them, physically, socially, mentally, emotionally for each and every grade. And it tells what they're going through. So today we are celebrating our first graders um, and we want to engage their interests. And that's our focus. And so as first graders, what do we know it's to be true? Is that they are beginning their reading, right? So we are giving our first graders these easy readers. And so we want to encourage this. And of course, it's Veggie Tales, right? We love Veggie Tales. And so our first graders are each getting one of these from Miss Taya. And then we're going to look at the pom-poms. Each of these palms represent, again, we have these in the nook. Um, this represents how many weeks we have left with our first grader. And again, we're at the end, <laughs> end of our school year, so that's actually probably less, right? Um, so there is, and on the back of our little pamphlet, it tells us 624. So Miss Taya counted 624, bless her heart. I don't have the patience, but I would have put it in there. I'm like, oh, that looks good. Um, <laughs> so 624 weeks, it seems like a lot, but that's to influence a child um, in Christ as they grow. So our other spectrum is the 11th grade. So we basically, at this point of the year, only have um, just a short time before their 12th grade. So um, our 11th graders... Our focus is to mobilize their potential, right? A lot of times it's, we're so either, okay, they're on their own or um, we don't want them to go, right? We're, we know that college is coming or they're after their adulthood. They call it adulting now, it's a thing. And so for them, we're going to encourage them to serve others. So we still have one more year to influence them at this time. So I have decided to give them a lighthouse. So as they're serving others, we all know Jesus is the light, right? And so they will have this signed, and I'll, of course, have scripture on the back to encourage them. I don't give them, I don't write the scripture out. I just put the reference because it drives them crazy, and they got to go and look it up. So um, Kira, my oldest, used to tell me that drove her crazy. She's like, just put it out there. I'm like, no. Now you have to go look it up. So Jesus is our light. And so for our 11th graders, as they're looking about adulting, I want them to focus. And like I said, we have 104 weeks with our 11th graders, which is actually less than that now, right? So keep praying for them. We still have big moments that we will celebrate. Again, I said uh, next month is May. And so that's our fifth in our 12th graders. And so we look forward to these big moments, and I have really enjoyed them to be able to celebrate each and every kid where they're at. 
and as a church we keep feeding into them. So let's pray for these students as we hand those out. Lord, we are grateful for all of our students. We celebrate the big moments of their life as their church family. That we can encourage them in ways that they don't feel it out in the outside world. That we love and adore them. And we look to influence them, to mobilize them, to engage them for you. For what we truly do is for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. I echo what she said there just at the end of the prayer report. What we do is for your glory. We come together to celebrate our God this morning. We stand with me. We stand with me. And we want to greet each other so we know who we're worshiping with this morning. We want to greet each other so we know who we're worshiping with. We center ourselves before we move into his courts. Again, we put on uh, those glasses this morning, those thankful this glasses and we're looking through those what are we thankful for this morning may that again be a filter that we do everything through this morning we are here to give thanks and may that color and influence our worship and our celebration of God and our Savior Jesus Christ this morning we want to sing about who who God is this morning so I want to encourage you to join in song also there's some prayer stations around the room if you want to uh, uh, engage in those, if at any time during the service you feel something tugging you away uh, from the presence this morning, from focusing on God, there's a wall over there. You could write down your distraction, smack it on the wall, and turn around and leave it behind you. Leave the distractions behind you. And if you want to spend some time in prayer, there's also another place there uh, as well. So throughout the service, even if you need to top off your coffee, if that's what keeps you in the presence this morning. <laughs> we want to do that. We want to do that. But we come together to celebrate and to sing this morning.
the Lord is risen. Even, Even though, though we have not touched his wounded hands, hands yet, yet we believe. Even though we have not heard him speak our names, yet we believe. Let us celebrate God's love in the life of Jesus Christ. Our God is good, right? Let's sing about that. Who's our God?
don't you sing we pray it, God? You are good. Oh God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Sing it again. Oh God, you're so good. You're so good to me. He is so good. He is so good, yeah? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. We come to worship to proclaim who our God is. We sing who you are. It's who you are, God. And we proclaim God is so good. He is good. He's good to us. He's always good to us. We come to a time we want to share uh, any thanksgivings, anything at all, um, joys. We want to celebrate exactly. Thank you, Teddy. <laughs> we want to celebrate together. So we want to share those joys. We celebrate as a, as a, as a gathered family here of, of worshipers and concerns, any concerns we may have so that we can pray and act uh, as a church strategically uh, for those things. So any Thanksgiving, joys, concerns, anything at all, anything at all. Yes. We had um, five different youth groups participating Friday night all together, and we all decorated all these cars and went through city so it's just a celebration that we are coming together and we're doing more coming up too so it's a really cool moment definitely celebrate uh what the youth is is doing if you haven't seen some of their artwork you can check out the bus out in the parking lot so it's good we're getting out out of the walls out of just this building and then moving out into uh the community and, and the connecting and uh being god's hands and feet anything else anything else Yes. Prayers for <clears throat> my friend Gary. I've worked with him for 30 years, and he lost his wife on Easter Sunday. Oh, okay. What was his first name? Gary. Gary. Okay, so we want to pray for Gary. <laughs> that is a shout of praise. <laughs> He's not like me at all. <laughs> anything else? Anything? Yeah. So uh, our church in the state is working. Uh, to make a lot of appointments right now to new churches, new pastors, new appointees, and it, I've learned that they are just exhausted. Um, so if we in this time can just hold them up, of course, selfishly for our church, um, but for the whole state. I'm gonna pray for those that within the, the denomination as they're making new appointments and, and moving uh, pastors around. <laughs> One of my students' um, father had a heart attack last week. He's okay. Well, he's in the hospital okay. and going through that work. So I'll pray for that. Pray for that. What was his student's name? Mason. Mason. So we're going to pray for Mason's dad. Anything else? Joyce. Yeah, Chuck. My friend Mark went to Cleveland Clinic Thursday. First time they haven't kept him there. All right. Hey. All right. Hey. We've been praying for Mark. Yes. We've been praying for Mark. So uh, he went to Cleveland Clinic and they didn't keep him. <laughs> they kicked him out. That's good. <laughs> Anything else? Anything else? Well, we definitely lift up Thanksgiving for uh, the sun is coming out, the beauty that, that God is, is showing, even though there's dandelions. But uh, we, we give thanks for, for all those things. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Will you pray with me and, uh, as we continue to move through his courts? As we continue to move through his courts. God, uh, we give thanks uh, to you. This morning we come, uh, we prepared throughout this week. We prepared. Uh, we spent time uh, in thanksgiving and in praise and in the word. God, and we come this morning to overflow. We come to overflow into each other. Oh God, we lift our praise to you. You are our, our joy this morning. You are the joy this morning. So we come to celebrate you, King Jesus. God, there's, uh, there's so many things to be thankful for. Help us to be reminded of those things uh, throughout our day, throughout our week. And God, there's so many things to be joyful for. So many things to be joyful for uh, right now here uh, at St. Joe. But we have some concerns on some things that we want to lift up. You've heard those. You know those, and some that were uh, not lifted up, God, 
you know them even before uh, they leave, uh, the breath leaves our mouth. So God, we lift up those concerns and we pray uh, that your will be done in those, in those things. And again, God, I come back to thank you. We give you thanks for the day, the breath that you give us for the purpose of praise. And this morning, we breathe that breath out in praise and prayer and in song, God. So thank you, Father God. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well this morning. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Sunday after Easter is always an interesting Sunday. Um, see who's going to show back up, and, and uh, uh, it, it, it's almost full again, which is great. Uh, glad to have those of you online with us as well. It's always good to be able to to worship together wherever we are. Uh, but we have come through Easter, and uh, I hope that we can continue to experience the joy of that celebration. Uh, Jesus Christ lived and died to save us. Um, so we, most of the time we hear a lot about Jesus and his disciples. Most of the stories about the uh, official 12 disciples who uh, were all men. But although they weren't numbered among Jesus' 12 disciples, many women were in his band of traveling companions. And actually we find in Scripture that it was women who provided the financial backing of Jesus' ministry. Uh, during Jesus' time, the religious elite didn't allow the Scriptures to be taught to women. But Jesus didn't follow those rules. He taught many women. In fact, the longest recorded discussion in Scripture that Jesus had with any single person was his discourse with the woman at the well. He shared with her his secret of being the Messiah, and she became one of the first evangelists. Jesus also used women in many of his illustrations while he was teaching. Um, one, one scholar writes, Jesus' honor and respect was extended to all women, an attitude largely unexpected and unknown in his culture and time. Jesus, unlike the men of his, his generation and culture, taught that women were equal to men in the sight of God. Women could receive God's forgiveness and grace. Women, as well as men, could be among Christ's personal followers. Women could be full participants in the kingdom of God. These were revolutionary ideas. Many of his contemporaries, including his disciples, were shocked. So we know that women were important in Jesus' ministry. Uh, this morning, you're going to meet some of the, the women that, that uh, some of those women uh, that made an impact in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Uh, so let's learn from their stories. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. When you picture Jesus with his disciples, is it just him with the 12? That's how I usually think about it. Let's think about the daily life of a woman in Jesus' day. They usually lived in small homes, and their lives consisted of cooking, baking, washing, and childbearing. Women were expected to be good wives and mothers and to stay at home. Hair must be covered. They were not allowed to go to school. That was for boys only. A woman was not to be spoken to in the street and must walk six paces behind her husband. Some people still live like that in this world, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I saw some at Kohl's the other day. <laughs> Not for me. All right, so no, Jew, no Jewish or woman court or Roman court allowed the testimony of women. They were almost like property, handed from their fathers to their husbands. The Gospel of Luke tells more stories about women than any of the other Gospels, 
And Luke's first letter to Theophilus contains 23 stories that are never mentioned in any of the other Gospels. We can be sure the crowds who traveled with Jesus were incredibly diverse, and women were among them. But these women weren't just following Jesus. They weren't just supporting him with their finances. They were following him as disciples and ministering alongside him. From chapter from Luke chapter 8 verses 1 through 3. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them at their means. The women you're meeting today are an example of what it means to follow Jesus, to give freely, to join him on his mission. Though we don't walk with Jesus in the flesh as they did, there are lessons we can learn from them. I am Joanna. My husband, Chusa, had access to considerable resources. He was the steward for King Herod's household. I was from a prominent Jewish family. Together, Chusa and I lent our resources, as well as our own possessions, to Jesus. Because of our connections, we helped smooth tense political situations for our group. I became loyal to Jesus after he cured me of my disability. When in the company of Jesus, I discovered an identity beyond that of being the wife of Herod's steward. I discovered my own ministry. I learned that the kingdom of heaven is accessible to anyone who is willing to give their life in humble service to Jesus and to others. Why is it your head covered, ma'am? By welcoming women like Joanna into his inner circle, Jesus broke with Jewish tradition and the strict social divisions of his day. Joanna stepped down from her aristocratic social position when she chose to follow Jesus and associate with his disciples. Her life is an example of how the gospel demolishes class barriers and social prejudice. Jesus, women of all classes were shushed or they were shamed. But after the Christian church, none of that happened any longer. Jesus did the, his uh, great effort in healing and curing me personally. I many issues. We women embraced all of our gifts in the early church and we started a fire for Christianity. Martha of 
Bethany, lived with her brother, Lazarus, and a sister named Mary. They were Jewish and friends of Jesus. Because their home was not far from Jerusalem, it became an important place of rest for Jesus and to avoid the crowds of Jerusalem. Their home was open to Jesus many times. I am Martha. One day I was preparing a meal for Jesus and I felt distracted having so much to do. My sister wasn't helping me. She was in the other room, caring for Jesus. She was washing his feet and anointing him with expensive perfume. I said, Lord, do you not care that she has left me to do all the serving alone? Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered by so many things, but only one thing is important. Mary has chosen the good part, which shall never be taken away from her. I realized I should care more about showing my devotion to Jesus even more than about public opinion. Jesus didn't care about a perfect meal or a room that was spotless. He wanted to spend more time with them, his people. Have you ever expected God to give you what you want and when you want it? Sometimes uh, we forget who we are talking to. I'm a Samaritan. I was going to the well near my town of Sektar. I was alone, and a man approached me. He sat down and he said, would you give me a drink of water? I said, I'm a Samaritan. You're clearly a Jew. He said to me, if you knew the Lord and you knew who it was that's asking you for a drink, you would have living water. I said, well, you don't have a cup. And what is living water? He told me he was the Messiah. Then he told me everything I'd ever done everything. How would he know such truths? Well, I was curious, but I wasn't afraid of him. I asked many questions. And when our conversation was over, he said, you will have eternal salvation. Soon his men, friends, came to join him. So I ran off. I even left my water jug. And I went back to my village, and I said, come, meet this man, talk with him. So they came, they were curious too. And they asked so many questions. He stayed with us for two days. And after my testimony and his teaching, my entire village of Sekar were believers. It is a sign of God's love and his care that he placed Elizabeth 
and the Virgin Mary in the same family. He could have just as easily made them strangers to one another, but by making them relatives, he gave them mutual comfort and encouragement. My husband is Zachariah. We were too old to have children. How old am I? Let's just say I'm advanced in years. <laughs> Zachariah went to the temple to burn incense and to pray. And while he was there, an angel of the Lord came and told him that we were to be parents and that we were to name the baby John. This child would be great before the Lord, and he would bring joy and gladness to many. Zechariah asked the angel, he said, how can this be? We are old. The angel said, because you have doubted, you will not speak until the prophecy is completed and the child is born. Shortly after that, I became pregnant I was in seclusion for five months, and I praised God and gave thanks, and I said, you have shown me favor. I am no longer despised among the people. In the sixth month, my cousin Mary came to visit. She too had talk, been talked to by an angel, and the angel told her about my baby. We were both filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. As soon as Mary arrived at Elizabeth's home, and Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, Elizabeth felt her baby move. In a loud voice, Elizabeth exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Yes, the Holy Spirit had told Elizabeth of Mary's condition even before Mary could say a word. And Elizabeth's son, he grew up to be called John the Baptist, and he ministered in the spirit and power of Elijah and was the prophet who prepared the way of the Lord. I am Mary, mother of Jesus. An angel came to me and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and God's power will rest on you. God chose me for the most important job in history, bringing our Savior, Jesus Christ, into the world. What did I say to Gabriel? After wondering aloud, how could this be, I realized. I am the Lord's servant. May his word to me be fulfilled. Carrying a baby outside of wedlock was both frightening and shocking. But God gifted Elizabeth to me as a comforting present. She was a trusted relative, and she was also going through a similar, similar miraculous event. I comforted Jesus as he entered this world and as he left earth to return to the Father. I watched Jesus for six torturous hours on the cross. Then Jerusalem was covered in darkness for three hours while Jesus hung in agony. I devoted myself to be there for my son, his 
birth, death, and beyond. I am Mary Magdalene. Magdala was a prosperous fishing village, and because of my many connections, I was a woman of means. I suffered from a neurological disorder, which some people believe to be called demons. But the day that I met Jesus, he healed me, and for that I was truly grateful. I and other women followed Jesus all the way from Galilee to Jerusalem. And I was even there the day that they nailed him to the cross. After the men deserted him because it had become inconvenient and dangerous, I was still there. I never left. Not even after he died. One morning I went to the tomb and I found the stone rolled away and the body was gone. There was a man who I thought was the gardener. And I said to him, please, if you know who has taken my Lord, tell me where he is. And then the man said my name. And I knew it was Jesus. He told me not to touch him, but to go and tell the others what I had seen. And so I ran to where all of the disciples had been in hiding and I shouted for joy, I have seen the risen Lord. When Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body, the women were there. The women helped prepare his body for burial. After all, they were Jesus' friends. After his death, they still weren't going anywhere. He rose, and the women were there waiting for him. Jesus saw women, all people, as created equal. He gave us so many examples of how to overlook our differences and be unified as believers with no regard of who they were or where they came from. Shouldn't our attitude be like that of Jesus? He has given every believer gifts whether you have identified them or not. He values our work. But then again, he did create us. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We want to sing together one last time before we move back out into the world in response uh, this morning what we just heard and again uh, we're here to celebrate who God is in our life and how we are part of that so you stand with me you stand with me so you sing again and actually if we could if we could put our hands together again for, for these ladies coming and sharing the story with us. thank you guys thank you thank you there's a story of the women within the, the ministry of Jesus Christ as he walked in the flesh in their midst. And he showed them through their faith that they could conquer fear, could conquer fear. They're no longer slaves to fear. And we proclaim those words together. I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I am a child of God. So by their faith and their witness and their ministry that they had, showing again, We've conquered fear because we know we are children, children of God. So we sing this one last song together before we move out in the world and we allow these stories to resonate with us uh, again as we continue to, to, to move and worship this morning.
from my enemies. Tell all my fears are gone. And we proclaim together that I'm no longer safe to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you've chosen me. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. We all have something, but the, the thing that breaks us out of that bondage is Jesus Christ. So go from this place with the utter joy of knowing that by accepting Christ as your Savior, you can live in heaven for eternity with God. So go with that peace. Amen. Have a great week.
a child of God.